I've got an image to maintain. Come on. Ignorance. <laughs> well, whatever. I don't want this stupid cookie anyways. Technically, it's a wafer. <laughs> okay, let's just get to the next speaker. Uh, Chris, do your stupid thing. <laughs> Chris Allen. <laughs> Hello, my name is Chris Allen, and I have gone over 1,200 days without feeling embarrassed. <laughs> That's not true, but I can freely and openly admit that I, myself, am an avid spray tanner. I call this shade Snooky Sunshine. <laughs> Additionally, I'm not mortified to reveal that in the mornings, I tend to wake up early just to sleep in my bathroom. Yep. You heard me. I set my alarm early, walk into the bathroom, prepare a small bed of towels, and I nap there. <laughs> yes, Mom, that's how all the towels end up on the floor. I'm sorry. That, however, is another story. Furthermore, I feel no shame in telling you that when Mr. Reuter asked me to perform this speech, I was trying to weasel my way out of a study hall that he had assigned me. My parents don't embarrass me either. Not even my father's midlife crisis purchase of a bright orange Harley Davidson. <laughs> or my mother's alarming amount of Osplon family tree knowledge. <laughs> I realize my apparent immunity to embarrassment puts me in the minority, but I'm okay with that. Sometimes, though, I do wish I knew what it felt like to feel my cheeks burn with disgrace. I want to feel this so I can better understand why we let embarrassment keep us from saying what we want to say, doing what we want to do, and being who we want to be. I distinctly remember feeling embarrassed during my elementary years. I was a gangly kid with pipe cleaners for arms and zero confidence. I was supremely uncomfortable in front of a crowd or a mirror. Looking back, seventh grade was probably the worst. My friends and I had begun liking these things called girls. They were hypnotic. I could not keep my eyes off them. They made their hair do weird things. They painted their faces, and they purposefully wore uncomfortable shoes. <laughs> More importantly, I could not risk doing something stupid in front of them. I was so afraid of being embarrassed that we would, when we would line up for chapel in the hallways, I would actually hold my breath so that these girls wouldn't view me as a dreaded mouth. It was unhealthy, to say the least. <laughs> Finally, eighth grade rolled around. I relaxed a little bit. As eighth graders, you're the king of the school. No matter what you do, it's cool. Even if you're playing a dog in a play that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> I remember thinking it was strange to no longer feel the intense fear of embarrassment, but I didn't give it much more thought than that. Unfortunately, by that June, I was literally too cool for school, and I graduated. <laughs> the following September, I showed up to high school for the first time. In just a few short months, I went from being the zenith of masculinity to the nadir of machismo. <laughs> Basically, I was the antithesis of the hulking, cultivated senior that roosts before you. Once again, lacking self-confidence, my voice cracking at every inopportune moment, fear of embarrassment rejoined me on my journey. Newly acquired braces prevented me from showing off my grills. <laughs> but worst of all were the seniors. When one of those testosterone beasts would walk by, just a little bit of pee would come out. I'd encountered these seniors before entering high school, but I'd always been in safe places, like at a friend's house, church, or yoga class. <laughs> Seeing them strut through the salmon linoleum hallways of DeCharms Hall was both majestic and terrifying. <laughs> if movies from the 1980s have taught me anything, besides that playing beach volleyball in your jeans is manly, and that... <laughs> 
and that calculator watches are cool, it's that bullies always pick on the shrimpy kids, like myself. I didn't want to be picked on. I didn't want to stand out. And I did not want to be embarrassed. So when spring came around, I picked up a lacrosse stick and I cradled it like a baby. <laughs> right now seems like an appropriate time to let you in on a little piece of Chris truth. I don't like sports. <laughs> at all. Don't like playing them. Don't like watching them. Don't like listening to people talk about them. I know this might seem strange to you, considering my Lax for Life video was a big hit. I'm sorry. I was acting. Needless to say, my freshman year of lacrosse was less than remarkable. I wasn't out on the field because I loved the action. In fact, I really wasn't out on the field. I was out there because I was embarrassed not to be. And how dumb is that? Embarrassment is a wrecking ball. It destroys the walls of our dreams. Think about all the things you would have liked to have tried, but were too afraid because you feared embarrassment. In my own life, I wish I could have tried ribbon dancing. <laughs> I wish I could have learned more about cat breeding. And I wish I could have joined a Kenny Loggins cover band. That's the funny thing about embarrassment. It makes us wish for so many things that we often forget to actually do them. So how have I managed to go for so long without feeling embarrassed? Well, besides flawless skin, <laughs> my secret is this, observing. Let me explain. When I came to ANC, I met Mauro de Padua. Sorry, Mr. Mauro de Padua, for the yearbook editors out there. I saw him as an instigator. He loved to go up to the new boys and verbally poke fun at them. I remember the first time he spoke to me, he called me a troublemaker. I hadn't done anything. I hadn't even said anything, but nevertheless, he called me a name and he got right in my face. What a bully, right? Well, that bully changed me. He was the first teacher that I made friends with. I didn't sense the same student-teacher relationship I had before. He was older than me and he was a figure of authority, but he never made me feel that way. Mr. DePadua loved to sing, but not many people know that one of the Reverend's favorite songs was Psycho Killer by the Talking Heads. <laughs> For fun, my classmates and I would often play the song in religion, but one day, he surprised us. He came out of his office and he bursts into song. Strangely, he didn't know the lyrics that well. He didn't know any lyrics, except for the chorus. But that didn't stop him from singing his balding head off. He would mumble through the verses and then scream and shout and yell all at once, Psycho Killer! And then he would bust some kind of Brazilian dance move. <laughs> Truthfully, we're really not sure how Brazilian these moves were. <laughs> but they sure were hilarious. The Depot didn't just sing songs about killers, he also sang songs about the Lord. His voice was easily the most distinguishable in chapel. Not because it was good, but because it sounded like microphone feedback. There's no nice way to say it, the man couldn't sing. And he knew it. And you know what? He didn't care. Morrow couldn't sing his way onto American Idol, but that never stopped him from trying his best. He only cared that it made him, him laugh and it made other people happy. And that's why embarrassment can be so damaging. It doesn't just prevent your own happiness, it prevents the happiness of others. And that's one thing that Mr. DePadua taught me. Not in the conventional lecture kind of way, but in the living your life kind of way. I believe that if more people live their lives the way that DePod sang, the world would be a happier place. <laughs> However, I would not take bathing suit advice from him. There are few people that can pull off a Speedo. Good evening.